sticks it to Gorn. Big Max Gorn is going to have a shot. If he kicks it, Melbourne will win. Gorn using all of the available time. 16 seconds, 15 seconds. Well, after trailing by 27 points midway through the game, the Demons fought back incredibly well but fell agonisingly short to the Cats in round one. Their co-skipper, Nathan Jones, joins us. I appreciate your time. Nathan, it must have been a devastating blow to see Max fade one left. Yeah, it was, Jared. Um, oh, it's, it's an unfortunate incident for that Max he finds himself in. Obviously, uh, every childhood dream to want to be able to kick that uh, winning goal, but in the end, I think you know we look back on the game. I think fundamentally, a few things broke down, particularly in that first half, and you know we'll review it strongly. I was pretty happy with the performance overall. There was some great fight and heart by the boys, but um, yeah, we'll keep it in perspective. Cam Guthrie, uh, what was his little chat to uh, the big fella about? They weren't comparing beards, obviously. <laughs> nah, not at all. I think he. Uh yeah, he uh, poked and prodded Maxi a little bit there with uh, some words. Obviously, Maxi missing the set shot at goal and they fired up. But, uh, yeah, obviously, emotions running wild. Um, as I said before, Maxi's chance, he was fired up and uh, he's very passionate, obviously. And should think... have, He should have kicked it, Jonesy, bottom line. I mean, it's a bad... Yeah, oh, there's no doubt about that, Gaz. I'm not making excuses for him, but... Um, yeah, you know, he'll go away and I think he'll, uh, he'll, he'll grow from that, uh, that incident, particularly as a leader and, um, you know, obviously a senior player and... Um, he yeah. kicked the beauty in the second quarter, he really, did. didn't he? So, um, you know, I think he'll review it hard. He's obviously after the game, you know, very disappointed. Um, you know, probably the weight of the world on his shoulders in terms of the result. But, um, you know, in the end, uh, you know, we look at the bigger picture. And as I said before, there were some fundamental things early in the game that let us down. I mean, men's will kick, miss one from about 12 metres <laughs> out too. So, <laughs> And that probably would ice the game. Yeah, it would so. have iced the game. So, yeah, you mentioned the defensive stuff and I was at the ground doing the game and it was amazing to watch in the first uh, half. I think it was 24 inside 50s for 20 scoring shots. So, obviously something good he spoke about at half-time. Yeah, no doubt. I think, you know, we had to manufacture some stuff. We've moving a few players around. Um, I think Louis went back which sort of gave us a little bit of, um, you know, steadiness down there. And, uh, you know, I think from that we got our game going. The way we played in the second half is, you know, the type of footy that we're trying to play. And This is early in the piece, obviously, in what Rusey's talking about, Jonesy. So, I mean, you, you as well. But, I mean, you, I don't want to pick on you, but you, you're the most experienced player there. And you, you see that, the two-on-one deep. What makes you then ping it off? Um, oh, it's probably, um, you know, some of that forward movement stuff is definitely in review. Uh, you know, speaking with Goody today, I think they're the things that we can fix up, particularly, you know, our structure ahead of the ball. Probably some of that is just uh, with how we've practised over the summer. Um, you would have seen that probably throughout the JLS, at JLT mm. series. But I think, as Ruzi alluded to before, the core of our game was, you know, we broke down defensively early and gave Geelong too many opportunities. You've changed your role from inside to the wing. It's a, a role that you got, what, 11 possessions in the first quarter and then you went to about three possessions in the second quarter. You seem half the time to be a structural player, preventing the ball from going rather than going and getting the ball. It must be a major <laughs> mindset change for you. Yeah, it is. I think, um, you know, probably the last 18 months, maybe two years, I've started to sort of filter into that role. I've added a little bit of playing at half back as well. I think, um, you know, the opportunities arise when we're good around the ball. That second quarter, we were starved around the ball. I think we lost, um, you know, contested possession in the second quarter alone by 15. So, um, you know, that hurts, you know, mm. the players that tend to play on the outside a little bit more. But, um, you know, I'm enjoying that. It's obviously added a string to my bow with playing out on the wing and half back. And, um, you know, I think the opportunities will continue to grow as we <clears throat> expose some of those younger key inside mid players and they become more consistent across four quarters. Selection was interesting, no Tyson and Brayshaw, which can be seen as a good thing. It, it says the depth is there. <clears throat> I counted about 14 that can go through the middle now, including Jesse Hogan and Petrarca and these sorts of blokes. Only Viney and Oliver would be the two constants, I reckon. So it, you know, further what Jared say means you're in and out, in and out. What's an ideal number? I know Ruzel tell you that having numbers to go through is great, but I mean, should we start to narrow it and close it and say, well, 75% is going to go to these six and the rest will pinch hit? Yeah, I think that's what we're probably working through that balance at the moment. I think, you know, Goody is very big on getting some versatility within our team. So, we, you know, we've got options to go to when it's not working. Um, you know, Tyson and Brayshaw, as you said, I think it reflects on the club in a really positive light. The fact that we had, I think it was 40 players trained on the 
Thursday before the game, so we're in terrific nick in terms of physically. I just jump in. There's some nonsense going around. The brace, uh, Tyson wasn't selected because he was a pivotal player in the camp saga. Yeah, you knocked it on the head with nonsense. It's absolute garbage when I heard that. And um, you know, unfortunately for Tyson and 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 Gussie Brayshaw, you know, um, they put in some strong performances throughout JLT, but it was a very tough selection. Having spoken to the coaches, you know, they said it was one of the toughest they'd been involved in at the time at the club, with so many players in form and so many players fit. Gary, how do you see? So Sorry, big, big, in, big inclusion uh, over the off-season, Jake Lever come across from Adelaide. He would have been disappointed with his day, especially in the first half yesterday. How do you see his role playing out? Because now he's going to have to play on the big boppers most weeks. Yeah, I think he was definitely disappointed speaking to him after the game. But in saying that, as I was, as alluded to earlier, you know, our defence broke down, which exposes him one-on-one. -on -one, and he's a, a drop-off player that reads the ball really well. And, um, you know, to Geelong's credit, they probably isolated him in certain scenarios. But at the same time, our pressure up the ground from our midfielders and forwards oh. didn't allow him to get, you know, great position and be able to defend at his best. I thought you could see with a kick that you probably should have been on the end of that he was beaten by the moment. He didn't handle the opening game and uh, he knew he'd made some errors early. And there was this moment here where he's just desperate to get a kick away. I mean, that's not the Jake Lever we know. You're sitting there in the middle of the ground and a bloke who's got his mind in the right space is going to look before he kicks and spot that up. So he clearly got better after half time when I guess he had a chat to somebody and settled. Yeah, I think he did settle after half time. I think, you know, we defended better as a team. It created more, you know, genuine opportunities for him rather than exposing our backs one on one. And I felt like, you know, we focus on a real high level of team defence. And when we don't perform, you know, from a forward and midfield point of view, it really exposes our guys one on one. And unfortunately, that was Jake's case in the mm. first half. But I think the character of the bloke, he's only 21 years old and hasn't played a lot of footy, but he's, the leadership he shows in being able to fight back and, and his performance in the second half was the reason why we uh, were so desperate to get Would him across. Would he play on Jesse Hogan in training? All the time. And it's a great matchup. I think, um, you know, he always, we always place our best defender on our best forward and those two have some key duels. But um, at the same time, you know, some of the stuff, as I said before, his, his real strengths come in dropping off and being able to intercept and some of the stuff I've seen over the, over the summer in particular, he's a, he's a star at that. And, you know, I think it, it might, might have taken him a half to find his feet yesterday, but he's going to be a very important player for us this year. Part of the development is, is a lot of the young players coming on. Christian Petraka's game was fantastic. Just his, I mean, the question a little bit, most players coming in is their endurance. Looks like he's improved that significantly. He spent a lot of time in the midfield and then was able to go forward and have a big impact as well. Yeah, oh, he's put in a huge pre-season. Um, you know, from the time you were there, you know, the work he had to do around endurance and he, uh, he put in a massive effort this this summer, there's no doubt about that. He was desperate to get his opportunity in there, and I think yesterday proves why. You know why we want to get him into the midfield. I think you know him and and Oliver in particular. They're uh, you know a brutal force with their uh, combination of contested ball and power and speed. So um, you know he's a lot of our guys have had strong pre seasons, but he's one of them that's really stood out. One of the biggest stories of the summer, of course, was the camp and the, the refusal of some players to not go there, rather than labouring the point again. I'll let you just have a look at uh, some of the thoughts uh, from the panel last week. I think it reveals a bit of a soft underbelly somewhere in the Melbourne playing list. That relationship between the playing group and the coach seems to have been challenged. You would like to think a strong club with a strong leadership and communication channels would be able to sort this out internally. So without labouring the point, how did you address it as a skipper? Yeah, look, I think there's so many... I, I knew this was going to come up, obviously. The Couch was my favourite show, actually, before Too Brandon nice gave us a slap. <laughs> but, um, nah, look, I think it's, um, it's been harped on so much. There's been so much opinion on the outside. Mm. But internally, it was addressed, as, you know, we've mentioned publicly so many times, you know, quite quickly and efficiently we went over it. Mm. Obviously, there was the breakdown of communication, which we've acknowledged, you know, um, we need to get better at that. And hopefully, um, you know, in the future... Having gone through this, we do find ourselves in a better position. But, you know, as far as I see and, and the footy club sees internally, it's irrelevant. You, it, must, you must have been disappointed that it became public. Oh, yeah, for sure. I think, um, you know, as we said, the communication breakdown, the fact that it went through the PA resulted in that. But as far as the result goes in 2018 and, and you know, what our footy club stands for and the results on the footy field, I think the camp is completely irrelevant. 
well said. How mm. relaxed are you at 30 years of age coming into your 13th season? You've played some finals. You've played two finals. First year. <laughs> Is there an anxiety about making sure you get back there before at age 35 or 6 or 7 or wherever you're going to get to? <laughs> 38. I mean... I mean, you, I mean, the rush is there, you can see the talent's there, we all think you're going to get there. Where's your head at in terms of when and how quickly and making sure it's done before your time? Yeah, up? I wouldn't say an anxiety. I'm not anxious about it at all. I'm actually excited. Um, you know, there's reasons why I committed to the footy club a long time ago um, from around the time actually when Rusey got on board. I signed a long-term deal for the fact that I wanted to see out, um, you know, what we were building. And right now, you know, um, having seen such a small... Um, light at the end of the tunnel back then, it's now wide open and staring us in the face and you know, destiny is really within our hands. Our playing group is in a terrific position. We've got a strong coaching group with a coach that um, is innovative and, and loves his playing group and, and leads from the front and I love being a part of that. I love leading that along with Jack and I think uh, the footy club's heading in the right direction. We understand, you know, we respect the game and understand how much hard work there is in, in terms of getting towards the push of finals but um, we're under no illusions either of, of what that's going to take. No, and there's, an, there's a rush from outside, of course. There must have been a rush for Jack Viney, who, I don't know whether you've spoken to him, made a decision late last year that I think he's ruining at the moment. How much, who's taking the responsibility <coughs> for the fact that your co-captain and best two or three players is not going to play for eight weeks, having had a whole summer off or to get over an injury? Yeah, I think hindsight's a wonderful thing. Uh, you know, at the time, everyone sort of spoke about it. Uh, Jack was feeling good at the time, uh, was capable of playing, actually may have been best to few at a couple of games uh, or those uh, preceding games after the surgery that he had last year. Um, ultimately, it probably didn't heal beyond that. You know, I think he flared it up towards the end of last year and missed a month after the surgery. I think he got back for two or three games. And the summer's been a difficult one. And as you know, you know once you've surgically cut your plantar fascia, there's some, you know, some serious mending that goes on with you know, those lower leg, leg injuries. And... Um, unfortunately, he's had a, um, you know, a different bone or joint flare up as a result of that, which is, you know, it's, it's hard to foresee that happening really, and, and it's an unfortunate thing. But I don't think there's anyone to blame really. Wouldn't be a Melbourne interview without asking about Jack Watts, and I know he's not at the club <laughs> anymore. But we'll, if you play finals footy this year, will you be disappointed that he's not part of the team? Uh, I think personally, I would. Um, you know, Jack was. Well, he's a great friend of mine, um, and I was rapt to see him do so well on the weekend. I think. Um, Is it know, a win-win? Do you think it had to happen? Is it best for him as well? I, I think on the weekend probably proves that point. As far as you know, seeing him play with some freedom, and I think you know, removing you know the sort of the stigma around his number one draft pick and the pressure that goes on his shoulders, as well as you know the the, the sort of reflects back on the club as well. I think it was best for both parties and. Yeah, you know, ultimately, I would have loved to have seen him being able to ride out mm. the storm because some of that, um, you know, excitement that I feel about, you know, where the club's heading is, you know, what keeps me engaged and why, you know, roll up to the club every day to give my best and keep improving. Mm. But, you know, Jack's going to create a new opportunity for himself and um, and with the Port Adelaide Footy Club, who are, you know, a very formidable side as well, and uh, I'm sure he'll play a very important role for them. So this week you're faced with the reality of AFL footy. For the last three months, people have been telling you you can even win the Premiership. Right now, though, you're down one game and you're going to Brisbane. And if you don't beat Brisbane, people will start knocking on your door. Yeah, oh, that's the beauty of the game, really. Um, you know, and I think it's, it's an opportunity for us to grow and learn from the chance we had on the weekend against the potential top four side in Geelong who have been so good for so long to now you know, regather ourselves in six days and, uh, and head up north and, and play the Lions, who, you know, I've watched their game quite closely on the weekend and they were terrific, particularly around the ball. They've got some star players and, you know, we'll have our work cut out. We have to play at our best, mm. but it's part and parcel of the competition right now. There's such small margins to be, to be good and um, even smaller to be great and that's what we're striving to be.